think it's started my Twitch stream. Yes, it should have started streaming and started recording. Excellent. Okay, so we, we can jump back to there. And it looks like it's mostly done its job. And if I move that up here, I can also get that to be visible in the Twitch chat. Right. Okay, so um, hopefully you guys can hear me and this is all working. Yep, hello, excellent. Um, okay, so <clears throat> in <laughs> this Friday lecture, um, I'm going to be talking about AI. Um, so we're going to go over uh, a, a sort of introduction to game AI. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Unity game AI um, and kind of some of the, the overall concepts of what we, we, we're covering. Um, and there are lots of kind of you know interesting resources and tools that you can dig deeper into AI using. So this is this is that higher level rather than kind of a step by step tutorial on implement this, do this, do this, because we've got a variety of people here. Um, uh, are particle clothing available somewhere? Yes, there is a link on the GitLab to the YouTube playlist for the past recordings, um, and I will put this on the. Um, on that YouTube playlist uh, for for you guys, um, and that will be linked from the GitLab. Okay, so they'll be they'll be there. Uh, now this is for my Norwegian students, so this is almost my Twitch channel. So it's it's you know it's Friday night Twitch channel, but it's it's um, in this case it's Friday lunchtime in Norway. Seeing I use the same channel for my my um, New Zealand students, so you know now uh, interestingly this week, beginning of the week, I gave a very similar, mostly the same lecture to my students here in New Zealand. Um, uh, but I, but that was focused a bit more on Unreal, seeing they're using Unreal. Um, whereas there are more of you using Unity, so I've got a bit more of a Unity bent on this one. And also, you know, I'm interested in you giving feedback and also discussing your previous experiences and tailoring this and tailoring the way I'm talking based on kind of some of the answers you guys give, right? So, um, Rather than just recording it, uh, I think it's actually useful to give it live, right? So you can interact with me. Um, cool. Okay, so um, we've got uh, messages there, and we do have the the Discord. If people want to jump into the Discord, and they can also make comments there. Um, so AI. Now, so traditional artificial intelligence. You'll find that there are kind of two general kind of schools of thought. Um, there's one that focuses on understanding intelligence. And so this is kind of neural simulation and, and it, you'll sometimes see it referred to as little a, big I, right? So it's artificial intelligence because we're interested in human intelligence, right? Because we're the, like, we're the only thing we know in the universe that is kind of intelligent and can understand stuff. So the computers and the artificial aspect is merely about understanding ourselves. The other side of it, often called machine learning, is replicating intelligent behavior without really caring about how humans or animals do it, just thinking about how do we make, you know, this bit of plastic, right? The piece of the plastic and metal you're watching us me on, um, making it do things that we think of as intelligent. We don't care how it does it, so long as it appears to be intelligent. Okay, so those are two, two of the main schools of thought in, in AI. So that's sure machine learning versus like neural networks and and neural simulations. Gain AI is a whole different kettle of fish, right? So gain AI is not really actually about making intelligent things. It's about creating interesting support characters and enemies for a player experience. And often the AIs are playing to lose, right? So their objective is to lose. And so they are they are explicitly trying to lose in an interesting way right so the ai isn't about making an awesome ai it's about making an ai that you know feels good to defeat so that sort of creating experience supporting the goals of the designer means that when you design your ai you don't think how do i make this beat the player you have to think how does this support what the designer was intending okay so that is, that's that quite a different approach to what we do. We also tend to worry about real time because we want this to respond in real time to the gamer. 
and we want it to be controllable. And that's one of the big problems for, for more advanced AI systems like Neural Network or AlphaGo, where we can't control what they do. You give them a problem, they learn how to solve it, and they can solve the problem. We don't know how they solve the problem. We can't tweak it to make it solve the problem in a more interesting way because we're not in control of the AI. Right? So this idea of, of controllability and also comprehensibility because part of the goal of the, a, a game AI is that you as players can understand what it does. Right? And that's a really important part of you defeating the AI is outthinking it. Now, an, an ineffable AI is a boring and annoying AI. An AI you can't understand and just does random stuff is either random and annoying or too freaking good, right? So um, we actually have to create very specific ways of thinking about AI again. Now, there are some interesting issues around emergent behavior with AIs, uh, and we get this in game rules, right? You can create some very simple game rules, and then you get some emergent, interesting player interactions. Dominant strategies are often emergent from a set of game rules. If your AI has a set of rules and you don't control that, you can get emergent AI systems where either A, potentially the player cannot defeat them, or they get stuck in a, in a redundant situation so they, they don't function, and, and therefore they lose the benefit um, for your game of that AI because it's not doing anything. However, on the other side, if you control too much, there are limitations on just scripting everything, right? So, so it's kind of this tight balance that you have to find between designing AI that does that is too flexible or too restricted. Okay, so um, now in Norway, you guys are currently doing the AI course, or you did an AI course earlier? So Twitch or uh, Discord chat um, to tell me whether you've like done the AI stuff. Um, because that's kind of you know interesting to see um, if if you've um, you for the for the unreal people yes you could watch I see this comment um, uh, you're doing it this a semester excellent um, we have the option of taking it this semester okay yes guys I thought it might be running this semester um, so yes for, for people who are using unreal um, there is actually an earlier lecture and the middle bits of that and actually the lecture I did or the the session I was doing yesterday afternoon in New Zealand, which will be on the Twitch stream if you go back to my previous Twitch videos, um, that has me fighting with Unreal's um, behavioral tree because scoping of the variables is can be a challenge. I find a solution and it eventually worked, but you get to see me kind of fighting with Unreal, which, you know... It's not exactly entertaining, but at least you get to see the lecturer not doing perfectly, uh, doing the job perfectly first time, eh, which could be fun. Um, so, um, yeah, so some of you are currently doing AI. Now, certainly the AI course usually is a mix of machine learning and neural simulation, right, for most traditional AI courses. And so I won't really go into this so much about the game AI and controllability of AI. So we'll, we'll be a wee bit different. Um, now... <clears throat> Rather than programming your entire AI system from scratch, it is much more usual to use an AI middleware, right? Um, so if you look in the Unity store, uh, I checked in last year when I checked, there were 297 um, AI-specific tools in the Unity store. So when you just looked at the tools in the Unity store, there were 297 last year. There were 340 this year, so it's an extra... 43 in the last year have been added as purchasable middleware tools in um, Unity. Unreal um, AI was mentioned in 350 of its plugins, right? So, so both of those major game engines have a large number of additional things you can buy or download that help you implement your AI. Now, there are some really, really important advantages to using a middleware tool. One is that much faster generally to get things working. Um, it's probably cheaper to use the tool than to spend the time to make your own. Um, now, I know you guys are students, and so you don't think of your time as valuable, 
But when you're a company and you are paying for every hour you spend coding, then when you look at a library that's worth $50, you think, can I do that in under an hour? If you can't do it in under an hour, $50 is incredibly cheap, right? So you've got to kind of switch, flip your mindset and say, well, as a professional, I have to value my time. And therefore, the cost of using an, a, a tool, even if the tool costs you money to buy, is probably much cheaper than you spending your time to do it yourself. Uh, and there's often technical support where if things aren't working properly, you can talk to the middleware developers and, and get some, some assistance. Now, um, there are disadvantages, of course, in middleware where, you know, they're generic solutions, so they might not fit with your specific game because your specific game might do something weird. Um, you also have, you know, a, a loss of control can be a problem. Um, yes, time to maintain and, and, to, and, and time to develop. <clears throat> in, like, <clears throat> this is a quite a complex decision. Right, so so knowing whether a tool will cost less is about asking the right kind of questions of the tools, right? And are you doing something that is relatively standard and consistent with what the tool can do, or are you tweaking it and doing something different? If you're tweaking it and doing something different, you then have a, a new calculation to make, right? And that's where you've got that loss of control becomes an interesting challenge. Um, so uh, I I. Um, I, I, I can't tell you, oh, use a middleware tool or don't use a middleware tool, right? Because it depends on the project you're doing, your level of knowledge of the tool, the amount of, re um, of how like, open the source is, can you get in and change it, how flexible the tool is, you have to make those decisions. And they are dependent on your skill and the project you're doing, right? So uh, unfortunately, there isn't a simple answer to say, oh, do this thing or this thing. Okay, so... Um, now, some of the technologies that we can talk about, and you'll, you'll find that there are systems that support all of these. Probably the, the most basic and one of the earliest that, like AI things you'll find in games is, is an A-star, a search strategy for pathfinding. Uh, and so that's that's one of the, the very simple, and we'll, we'll go over a wee bit of A-star. Um, if you're doing AI at the moment, have any, like you only just started the course, have you covered A-star? Or have you covered A-star in one of the earlier graph Algorithms courses. Do you know what A star is? Just so I've got a feeling for whether I how deeply I need to explain it. Now I should look straight down because that's where yep, you it. So I should look there, even though you're actually my screen. <laughs> so, um, right. Yep. No, I was I was hoping that you might have done the the, the A star in, in like an algorithm course or because. Uh, it's such a simple graph theory thing that it's it's relatively cool. So, so A star finite state machines again used in a lot of games. This idea that that you have things like a patrol state, and then when you see the player, you move from the control state into a chase the player state, and then when you're in range, you move into a attack the player state. And if the player runs away, you move back into the chase state. And if they go so far away that you don't know where they are, you go back into the patrol state. Right. So there's there's finite state machines. There are scripts, goal-oriented behaviors, simple agent behavior. Right? So we'll, we'll go over a few of those. And there are some more advanced stuff, which we won't cover today. But if you're really interested, we could dig into more interesting AI techniques. Some of these are not used to simulate, to, to be an enemy or to be uh, a, um, a companion AI. They are used to model you as players. Right? So those those more advanced AI techniques aren't necessarily directly used inside the game, but they may be used by the game company to understand how players are using the game. So, um, I will, um, seeing there is... Um, yeah, I will just quickly go over. I've got the slides here. Okay, so A-Star is one of the core search algorithms. If you want details, you can go and find lots of example tutorials for it. But the principle of A-star is that you've got a, a graph, right? So you have nodes connected to other nodes and that there is a weight that it costs you to travel between those two locations, right? The two, two nodes. Um, so when you, when you have that transition, 
uh, you have this kind of an initial cost to make that transition. We also have to have a system where we can estimate how how much we think something's going to cost, right? So, you know, I can be sitting in the lab and think, how much, how, how long is it going to take me to get to the canteen? Uh, and so I can think, well, you know, it, it's going to be, it's going to take me five minutes to walk from the lab to the canteen, right? And I have the current is kind of in that direction. So I've got a kind of an estimate of how much it costs and an estimate of sort of the direction to search it. Now, ASTAR uses this idea of a heuristic, a guess in the kind of cost and direction. Um, and so long as you're, in ASTAR terms, as long as you're optimistic, you always think it's going to be less than it actually is. In that case, ASTAR will guarantee the shortest path. Right? And that's why it's often used because it's a nice algorithm guarantees you your shortest path with some relatively simple constraints on there being a cost and your guess at how far away things are is always optimistic. Now, um, normally we think of this as paths in space, so like going from the lab to the cantina, um, but you can actually do some interesting things where the costs can adapt, can be adapted to the environment. So, for example, um, I mean, if you're going from the lab to the cantina, you're walking on, on um, through... Um, hallways, but if you had to go outside and it was deep snow, then that might slow you down. So you can use an environmental cost of, you know, oh, and I would have to put on all my snow gear and it would be a real hassle. And so, so there is additional costs, even if the geographic location might be close because you'd have to go outside, the total cost might be more, right? And also it might be harder. Um, Interestingly, there is there is um, you can you can start building on ASTAR uh, and say, well, you know, instead of just modeling kind of direct cost, I can also have some frustration modeling, where um, when when uh, something is blocked and I try and and get somewhere, I can try and raise other values and and count a frustration. Um, there are some problems, and you can see here. This is so in the bottom corner, right? So down down. Whoop, um, so just down there is a um, is an is an example of how an A star system would search from a red node to a green node, and you can see it's it 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 searches by guessing in that direction. Now it hasn't moved yet, right? So what A star does, A star basically does a thought process and thinks through each of those nodes and checks if those nodes can get to the goal. And when they're blocked, it then starts searching out wider and wider and wider until it finds that path. Now, one of the problems with ASTAR is it's slightly, it can create unrealistically perfect pathfinding. So it always finds the shortest path. Now, sometimes a companion AI, you don't want to do that. I remember that was a, um, I, was, I was playing a, a, a Lord of the Rings game. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I you could do is with your um, units you could click randomly into the fog of war on the other side of the map right and you'd watch your units you'd click way over the enemy base and your unit where you thought the enemy base might be a high fog of war couldn't see anything and your unit would suddenly start walking sideways rather than walking towards where you'd clicked and you go aha there must be a mountain path there must be mountains between us and the, the enemy and it's looking it's found the mountain pass through the, the fog of war. So my units knew more about the world than I did. And I could use that fog of war. I could use the where they're going to start walking as a kind of hint as to the structure of the world, even though I couldn't officially see it because of fog of war. Um, one of my favorite bugs that I found in, in that particular um, Lord of Rings um, game which was a, had a, a, a base building feature is you could take your your base element when you're going to go and pay, like build a building and you know when you could build a building it would be green and when you couldn't build a building it, it would be red right so standard ui feedback red green um one of the weird things you could do is you could take that red green building you could take your building your proposed building you could take it into fog of war and you'd roll it across fog of war right um and then suddenly it would turn red. And it would turn red when there was a building that you couldn't build on, and it would show you the outline of the overlap between the building 
in Fog of War and your proposed building. And so you could go and map out the enemy base with your build tool. Right? So it was kind of a an emergent thing they hadn't thought of when they added the, oh, we should show them when they can't build. Because that wasn't interacting with the Fog of War property. Right? So there's like, you know, interesting, weird interactions that you get which kind of emerge from, from different rules. So so A star, this unrealistic optimal path, can unfortunately reveal information that you might not want the player to have. Now, some of the interesting things, um, because A star doesn't re isn't required to be geographical, it could be conceptual nodes that you're moving through. And so this is one of the things that that Halo 2 did, is they said, okay, so so all you need for Haystar is to have like nodes and a path and that there's a cost between the nodes and you've got a guess for which it might be the shortest. Well, I could use those nodes as states of the game and I could have the arc, arcs between them actions that my AI could take. And so instead of using A star to map geographical path, I could use A star to find the optimal action path through a node of through through a graph of potential worlds with actions being the arcs between them rather than movement being the arcs. And so in fact, um, Halo Two had the AIs planning what they would do by doing an A star through their action graph. Right, so they make a graph of all the actions they could do and iterate those and then make and, and having that graph they'd use an A star to, to work out the sh the best path through action space rather than location space. Right? So so it's interesting you can reuse that algorithm not just for geographical pathfinding, but conceptual pathfinding. Uh, and one of the well, the other things you can do is and, and this is this is a neat way of, of adding things to AI, is that Rather than just kind of having a static map, do the shortest path, walk along the road, you can have multiple layers of graphs, of, of terrain, and some of those can be different for different AI types, right? So you could have, you know, and this is the standard, your tank can roll on the road easily, but can't go through the long grass, whereas your infantry unit moves the same speed through the long grass as it does on the road, right? So you can, you can have different units having different costs by having the maps that they look at when they're going through the A star being different. However, once you've got a map, you could update that map. One of the things you could update that map with would be, you know, you've got a choke point where you've, where you've got AIs walking across a bridge, and so the player takes up a sniper location and starts sniping the units on the bridge. And so what you do is you paint on the map that that has higher cost to walk over that bridge, which means the first few AIs trying to get to your base will walk over the bridge, you'll snipe them, they paint the, the area on the bridge as being a deadly zone, and then after a few of them get sniped, they'll go looking for another way of getting to your base. So it looks like the enemy has learnt to avoid going over the bridge. They haven't, they're still just doing a simple A-star pathfinding but you've made the world intelligent, right? So you've made the environment more intelligent rather than making the agent more intelligent, right? So rather than changing what's happening in the brain, you've changed what's happening in the world. And this is one of the key things to understand in games is that we don't need to make the, in, the agent the most intelligent thing. We just need to have the right effect in the game. And so if we can make the world more intelligent, then yes, that's a, that can be a very effective way of building what looks like clever behavior. Now, um, if you've uh, if you watch ants collect food, one of the things you'll notice is that they they like you know they they follow ant paths, right? So they're like you get an ant trail where you've got a whole bunch of ants running along the trail. Well, that's actually what the ants are doing is they're making the world more intelligent by leading scent trails, and it's actually a very simple system because when when you're a hungry ant, you come out of your hole and you just wander off. And you're leaving the scent trail of being hungry. When you find food, what you do is you go, oh, I found food. You put your mandibles on it, and suddenly your brain goes, oh, oh, I better go where people were hungry. 
because I've just found food, so I'll take it to where people are hungry. How do I know where people are hungry? Well, I'll sniff around and find a trail of hungry pheromone. And given on the first ant that come here, the hungry pheromone will probably be my path that I just came in. I, I don't know it was my path, but I can just smell that hungry pheromone, and I'll just walk down that hungry pheromone path until I find a whole bunch of hungry ants. Um, now, once I've got the mandible, once I've got my mandibles around my bit of food, my pheromone scent changes because the sugar changes how I smell. So as I walk, I leave a, a scent trail of the I'm an ant that's found food. Now, if I'm an ant looking for food and I come across a trail of an ant that had food, that's probably where the food is. So I will then turn and follow that path. Now, this is very much like when you're at a, like if you're at a big, big sporting event and you want to know where the hot dogs are, what you do is you look for people who have got hot dogs and where they're walking from, right? And so you walk upstream, you walk against the people carrying um, pulsa and lumpa, right? So you, 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 and that will take you to the source of the pulsa, right? Because that's, you know, how you find where the food source is. And basically, what that's what ants do, except, you know, it's more like they're dripping um, ketchup on the floor as they walk with their, their hot dog, right? So, um, yes, and yes, you do feel like an ant at festival. <laughs> Actually, you're packed in, you're just kind of being squeezed around, right? So, yeah, um, but making the world intelligent rather than the agents intelligent is something you often do in game with trigger points, the nav mesh in Unity isn't about putting a navigation map in the head of every AI. The nav mesh is about putting the navigation mesh into the world, making the world intelligent. And then the AI in the head of the agents can be simpler. It doesn't have to know the map of the world. It doesn't have to have a map of the world in the AI's head. That map of the world is stored in the world itself. Okay, so that's a technique where the world becomes more intelligent so I can keep a very simple agent. You'll also see this where they like paint arrows on the ground to try and get people to follow that. Or if they're really worried that, you know, they paint footsteps, right? To try and tell you, oh, your feet should go here. Um, which is kind of, wow, you, I, you, you're really worried about my intelligence, right? Because, <laughs> you know, you don't trust that I can fo follow the abstract symbol of an arrow. You've drawn footprints to try and really get it down to my level, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, so no, you've, you've got kind of these these environmental signals, which allow you to have a very simple AI and yet still have a really interesting game environment. And it also means that you can, that the designer is able to, to manipulate the information in the level and be able to predict what the AI will do because the AI is so simple, right? And all the AIs share that level information. And so all the designer has to do to change all the AIs is not trying to work out how do I change that in each of their heads? It's a, oh, I'll just change this about the world, and then all the AIs will do their simple thing and respond to the world correctly. Okay, so it's that. You've got to kind of work your head into that kind of space when you're thinking about AI in games. Is not, how do I make my AI intelligent? It's a, how do I achieve this effect by combining the world and the AI itself? Now, one of the interesting examples of that is if you've, if you played Batman Arkham City or Arkham Asylum, one of the beautiful things about Batman, and we can show a video of this, is one of the beautiful things about the Batman game is the fluidity of the attacks, right? That, that he spins around and his spin kicks hit the head of the enemy and the punches land really beautifully on the bad guys. Now, how that's achieved is that when the player who's playing Batman starts the punch animation the Batman character takes over the AI of the NPC that he's hitting. And the Batman character moves that NPC to the right place so that the fist at full extension will hit perfectly on the face. So the AI, um, the, the NPC, loses its ability to control itself as, as Batman takes him over and pushes him to the right place so that the animation will look right as Batman punches the, the um, NPC. So there, it's actually giving up control to the main character to control that and move things so it looks better. 
Yeah? Uh, and so this idea of, of, of what's happening, the AI that you actually, that, that you create as a game designer isn't the same as what the player might experience. Okay, so now um, this kind of, of, of dynamic changing is is great and you know if you want if you're going to change you're going to paint sort of you know blood on the floor so that they don't walk over the bridge right that's great because you get those kind of interesting different behavior however that can limit your a sense of control right and sometimes the designer will want to be able to control exactly what the ai does and so this is where we move into scripts or scripted behavior and this is done by either having triggers in the world and then once you've triggered something it's going to follow through a script a sequence of actions uh, and sometimes it will do this almost irrespective of what the player does uh, so sometimes you'll see this in first person shooter games when you rush into a room and then you duck behind the first bit of cover and all the ai's kind of suddenly move to cover and start shooting at you right and you have this you know popping up from behind cover shooting and ducking down and they're all popping up from behind cover and shooting and, you know, it feels like, you know, they've, got, they've, they've seen you and they're joining cover. In some of those games, if you sprint across the room to the far side of the room, all of the AIs will take cover, except the cover they take isn't behind a barrier. It's now in front of the barrier because you're no longer where the script says you would be. The script says you're going to be by the door. So they're taking cover from someone arriving from that door over there. But you're now standing in the other side of the room and so they don't know to take cover from where you currently are because that's not in the script. Right? So often scripted behaviors break. And that's because unless the player also follows the script, your defined set of, of, of actions is no longer consistent with the world. You'll see this in cutscenes where, you know, in some games, a companion character could be killed during a level and then still appear in the cutscene. And it's kind of, yeah, but that character died and some of the old games the cutscene would still have them in there because you know they'd only made one cutscene right it's uh, so what the so what if the commanding died you did your your gameplay is changed by that but the cutscenes don't get changed right and that's where kind of a script fails okay. however scripts are really really useful um they are are often implemented in games just so you can get an ai that does a combination of interesting behaviors that you know are important for the narrative and the story progression right so so that's where you can't just say well we we can't script any ais because you might need that complexity for the story you're trying to tell on the far end of that right so that's scripted and you tell what we're still on the far end of that is what we call emergent behavior now if you add simple rules like we're doing with astar where we start well once we started dynamically changing the ground we might get some emergent behavior from the AI and from the AI because we don't necessarily we haven't told the AI, oh, when you get shot here, get find another path. We've just changed the world and hoped that it will then not choose that path. And you know, you could you could do some interesting things with the death paint. You could have like berserkers who ignore the risk that you've painted on the ground and so will still take the bad the, the crazy path. So, you know, you can you can create some interesting emergent behaviors by, by having ones that follow some of the rules but not other rules. However, once you've got these rule sets and you're letting behaviors be defined by a set of rules rather than a script, you can end up with emergent behaviors. Now, um, one of the classic and early emergent behaviors is called voids. Um, uh, and, and this was three simple rules. Right? And it's, it's, it's a complex, what looks like a complex behavior coming from a very simple rule set. So the, ball, ball, the Boyd's rule set is avoid collisions. That's the first one there, right? So if and you look at the people around you and go, oh, 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 I don't want to collide with you. The second rule is you look at the people in your circle and your bubble and you go, oh, I want to do the same thing that everyone else is doing, right? So you kind of shift to a line with all the kind of centroid behaviors. And the last one is I'll look at the group around me and I'll try and be in the center of all of my friends, right? All the things I can see around me. So I, I avoid collisions. I try and move closer to them, right? So that kind of creates this, this dynamic balance that I'm trying to, and I'll try and do what they do. Okay, so some very simple rules. Um, but the problem with these kind of emergent behaviors, and this creates a blocking behavior, and it looks like this naturalistic flock that moves and adjusts and 
It avoids obstacles because that obstacle, first rule of obstacle avoidance, you can just put it in static objects and it will avoid those. It creates this beautifully organic feeling um, flow of, of characters, but it's hard to directly control. Right? And unfortunately, getting that balance right between simple rules and knowing what they'll do is is challenging right? and certainly planning for your game to have good emergent behaviors is incredibly tricky so um here's an example if you want to go there's a youtube video here so so just to show you what this looks like um oh he's going to talk at us as well um but if we ah, go away my So I'll just take you to where he shows you an example of these. Boy, there we go. Um, so this is what it looks like, right? So it looks like all of these these units. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this idea is it's kind of creating this complex behavior. You can play with them, right? So that's an example. So, so, so yeah. I, if you're interested more, you can you can kind of look into how you can implement voids. Voids are a really simple thing to implement, and and it can it often people I've seen people use this kind of simple thing for zombie like a horde of zombies. So you don't have to pathfind with every single zombie. You just have like a horde of them, and they move together as a unit. Um, some of you, in fact, like all of you, are probably born after this, but. Um, you might have heard of The Lion King as a Disney movie. You probably watched it as a kid. Okay, possibly, maybe. It was possibly before your time. However, in The Lion King, one of the major scenes is where a bunch of um, wildebeest careen over the top of a gorge and then run down into the gorge and then run through the gorge and kill um, uh, Simba's father, Mufasa. Uh, I have children, I know the names of these things. Um, now, that was one of the first uses of this algorithm in movies. The wildebeest are actually controlled by a Boyd's algorithm rather than hand animated. Right? It's one of the very first times they, they use computer algorithms to manage animation rather than doing all the hand drawing themselves. Right? Because I think 94 was the Lion King, so it's quite early for this kind of computer controlled animation. Okay, so that's the boy's algorithm. Go and have a look. Watch the full video. You can kind of see the fun of this. Now, one of the interesting things about emergent behavior is that, you know, players will ascribe intelligence to emergent behavior. They'll say, oh, oh, look, they're trying to get together. They're trying to flock. The answer is no, no, no. They're just doing those three simple rules. But we create a narrative around it. Now, there's research that shows that if you create if you just increase the hit points the the health of an enemy the players will think those enemies are more intelligent even if they behave exactly the same as earlier um, enemies it's just that they're harder to kill because they have more health because humans don't really understand how intelligence works we, it just is a reflection of how difficult it was for us to defeat that enemy and the harder it is, the more intelligent they are, right? And so some of the kind of, it, it, it's not actually more intelligent. You've just cheated by giving it more health, but yeah, that, it works, right? And so if that works, you've won, right? If, you, if the player believes it's more intelligent, then it doesn't matter whether it is or not. That's the player experience, and that's what you're trying to create. Um, interestingly, if you add randomness to some of your AI decisions, players will think that the AI is doing more complex things because they will create a narrative around why the AI went and did something slightly random. Okay, so it's like within reason, right? If they just do completely random things all the time, then the AI will laugh at them. But having some variation and not having them always deterministically doing the same thing, the player will, will, will create that narrative. And if that's your goal if, it, goal, if your goal is to get the player to think that they're intelligent, then you can kind of cheat it by doing some of these hacks by giving them a bit more health giving making them a bit more random right um again you do the ant style thing of 
of making the environment more intelligent and the player will think that the enemy is more intelligent. Uh, in one of the Killzone games, um, they didn't implement flanking, right? Because uh, that flanking is something you could do where you like have, have your AIs attack the player from both, uh, both sides. They never implemented that as a tactic. However, they had the AI shout out, let's flank him occasionally, because occasionally the AI would flank you. Right? And because the it occasionally happened, randomly by where the AIs were, um, and occasionally a, the AIs would yell out, let's flank him, the players assumed that they'd created a cool flanking behavior in the AIs, and that most of the time the player had cleverly avoided it. They hadn't. It was just random. But by claiming it, it made the players value the AI more in that game than they would have otherwise. Right? So this is, is kind of a... <laughs> unfortunately letting you in as players to realize that actually the AI sometimes isn't that intelligent. Um, it is just a, a clever hack and it had the desired effect on you as a player. Um, and when you're trying to think of how to do things, sometimes you have to kind of reverse your thinking as a designer. So for example, if you want to know, um, say I'm trying to, to get cover, okay? So if I'm looking at, do I have cover, right? So if I'm, I was creating, trying to get an AI to get into cover, right? You could look at it from the AI, try and say, oh, the player's over there. And then if I say they're over there and I'm over here and I can try and work out a cover zone, it must be behind this thing. And so I move over because I'm trying to work out from the player's perspective what they could see. No, no, what I do is I just explicitly ask the game engine, oh, game engine, ray trace from the player to me, Right, or to the to the the object and see if they can see it. Right? So and you know, I can put myself behind an object, do the test, get the game engine to test, can the player see me there? And if the player can see me there, then I know it's not in cover. Right? So so rather than kind of doing clever things, you just force the player to do the calculation and get the game engine to do the work for you. And then it's not inside the the AI's head, it's in the world. Right? And if it's a static environment, you just paint that on the ground um, and that's what Killzone was doing is that they would create a threat map based on where the player was and so instead of the AI having to work out where the threat was coming from the character the, the threat would paint itself into the world and then the AI would look at the ground and go ah okay so the player can see there right not because I've kind of worked out what the player can see just because the player has painted that, like, you know, invisibly for the player themselves, but they've painted the, the world with their threat, and then I just have to A-star through the painted world. Okay, so this kind of constantly thinking about how not not how do I make the thing intelligent, how do I use techniques to appear intelligent? Okay? Uh, and if you when you're making these AIs, lots of debugging. Uh, you need to have you need to turn on the debugging, you need to trace through what the AI is doing. So how smart should the AI be? Well, if you make your AI too intelligent, your players will assume that it's cheating. Right? So um, one of my friends, his father never played internet poker, right? Would not play poker on the computer. And the reason he wouldn't play poker on the computer is because the computer could see his cards. Right? Because if the cards are shown on screen, the computer must know what those cards are. And so the computer is definitely cheating. Because how could it know what the cards were and not cheat? Now, your players will assume that you are cheating if, if it even feels vaguely like you might be. Uh, now, um, this, again, uh, this was an interesting challenge in the, in, um, the Batman game, in fact, the Mr. Freeze battle um, in uh, Arkham City, I think it was. Um, then uh, I had a, a friend who was doing some of the AI design there, and he had thought, oh, well, you know, Mr. Freeze is an intelligent boss, so when Batman runs through a window, I can see Batman running, and I know how fast he's running. 
So I could just turn to the end of the corridor, calculate how long it will take. If Batman just continues to run at the same speed, I can calculate how long it's going to take for him to come out the other end of the, the corridor, and then I can fire a rocket, rocket at him, and he will he will run into the rocket and get killed at the moment he comes out of the corridor. Even though I'm not tra tracking him, I've just done a you know standard velocity calculation. Very simple. The playtesters threw their toys because they felt the game was cheating. And even though it tried to explain that, you know, so Mr. Freeze tries to explain that, haha, I can track you and I see where you're running to and tries to explain what it was back. No, math calculation, the players still felt it was cheating. And so you just kind of have to drop that kind of thing because although it's simple to do, it's hard to convince the player that your AIs are not cheating. So, you have to step back from making clever AIs, because even if you've done the clever thing, they'll still think you're cheating. Also, you have to explain to the player what the AI is doing. Now, you'll often find in games, AI is considered a sub-branch of animation. I don't think, well, but why is it a sub-branch of animation? That's graphics thing, and AI is separate to graphics. And you answer, well... Traditionally, in, in the games community, if you can't see it, right, so if the player can't see an animation, it didn't happen. Right? Pictures are never happened. Basically, unless you can show me with an animation something, the AI didn't do anything. And so AI was just there to choose what animation to show to communicate to the player what the state of the game was. Right, so the AI isn't there to be clever. The AI is there to communicate to the player. And so it, it is part of animation. It is not part of gameplay. Right, which is you know, an interesting way of thinking, but that's how it was originally conceived. And so the whole idea here is that you have to give additional information to the player. So when you're making your AI, you have to visually change its state. You have to make it do something, right? Make it a big flourishy statement or yell out stuff to communicate to the player what's going on. Okay? Now, um, in the Halo games, when they first did the the um, the little shriekers that would we triangle characters that would run away um, when one of the big hunk, um, hulks was was killed, right? So they had this this AI behavior where you kill a hulk and the little um, triangle grunt would run away from that that big hulk when it when it died none of the playtesters noticed this behavior, right? Because they wanted it to be a game mechanic where you'd shoot the, the, the Hulk and then all the little minions would run away and that would give you a chance to advance. So to inform the player of the state of the AI, instead of the little grunt units just running away, what they did is they threw their hands in the air and went, ah! as they ran away, right? To make it incredibly obvious that was this massive change in state um, just to try and get that information to the player. So if you're doing clever things with your AI, find a way of animating it, showing it, changing the color, communicating with the player what's happening in the head of the AI. Because without that, your player will either assume the AI is cheating or that it's not doing anything at all. Okay, so, so yeah, it's, it's this constant balance. And that's why... AI, programming is about communication. Games are often about communicating the rules and communicating what to do next. And AIs are about communication with the player, right? The player must be aware of the AI. You've got to exaggerate. Um, try and find a way of kind of using the theme of your game and going over the top with that. And find ways of rewarding the player for outthinking the AI, right? Because that's the, that's the job of the player is to kind of you know, feel awesome because, you know, they're more intelligent than the AI. And, you know, if you want them to, if you want it to be harder, you could just increase the health of the AI. Still doing the same thing, it's just harder. And so the player feels better because it's a harder AI to beat. Okay. So you've got to kind of balance that stupidity. Okay. So some tools. Lua is a very common tool in the AI community. Um, Less so recently, um, because you'll find that people are using behavior trees and, and, and not coding their own independent 
scripting language. However, Lua, most of Angry Birds was built in Lua. There is malware built in Lua. The, the World of Warcraft UI was built in Lua. So it was, it was and is used still in games. Um, it's a scripting language which communicates through a stack. And so it can communicate with C++. Um, and it communicates by, by this is kind of example code, uh, where in C++, you, you bring in the libraries and then you load the Lua file and then you can communicate both from C++ to call fu functions that are in Lua and from Lua to call functions that are in C++. Okay, so it's kind of this, a new way of calling things that are in the core engine. Now, part of the reason we do this is we compile the C++ to create the game engine itself, and yet still change logic by changing Lua. Okay. Um, Lisp. Can you can you use Lisp? Yes, you can use Lisp. I think there is a Lisp plugin for Unity. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, so let's go Lisp Unity. I think they probably. Oh, that's like I misspelled it. Lisp Unity, scripting Unity, Lisp Unity. Yep, I thought there might be. So yet yeah, there appears to be a um, Lisp scripting Unity. Um, yep, there'll there'll probably be some way of of having a Lisp interpreter added as a tool into Unity. Um, I yep. Ripple. Um, so <laughs> yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's one of the. It, it, if it's possible, the internet has done it. So yeah, um, the prob Yeah, there is a way of also using Lisp and Unity. So uh, you can look at how you can use those tools to combine something like a scripting language that does AI in an interesting, interesting way into your game engine. Now, um, in Unity, there's uh, Moonsharp is a tool that you can use that will allow you to use U Lua in Unity. It's also, there's a um, there's an asset store and there's a GitHub repo for it so that you can actually go and you can you can download the repository itself and implement it and, and install it or you can just buy the asset, right? So so these are, are um, ways that you can then start using Lua in, um, in, in Unity. Unity also provides a few AI tools so um, Unity provides waypoints, which is one of the simplest ways of doing AI, and because what you can do is you can set in the level. Hey, 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 hey come on, come on, it's okay. Um, my my father's dog, because I'm I'm at my dad's house, and my father's dog here is is just I think wanting. To hello, say hello to the noises. Here we go. Yeah. Um, so yep, so I'll I'll. Do you need to, do you need the door open? Okay. Just think I'll open the door. Right. Um and <laughs> he just yes she needed to go out to the toilet i think um and you just heard the electronic doorbell go oh the dog's gone outside um, so so one of the things that that you need to provide you is, is these waypoints now waypoints are we as we're talking about putting intelligence into the level is that um <laughs> yes she's a, she is a good boy um ah so isn't C Sharp already a scripting language? Yes, C Sharp is a scripting language. The reason why you might use Lua on top of that is because you may already know Lua or have some uh, have a designer who knows Lua or you like the way Lua does some stuff or you've got a library of AI stuff that you want to bring in from Lua. And so, you know, there are different tools that allow you to program in the language that suits the way you think, right? So C Sharp might be a way you think and so that's a great language you might find that you think more like lua and so you want to use lua right? there are ways of, of using these tools now okay so back to waypoints waypoints are the idea that you put dog coming back in um you put waypoints in the level and then the the 
the AIs can move towards those waypoints. So that the AI doesn't have to choose where it's going to go, the AI just has to move uh, actively towards waypoints. Now, um, when you've got more intelligent AIs that actually want to find their own path, that's when you use NavMesh, right? And so Unity has an excellent NavMesh, and you just drop that in level, and again, so the, the world knows about where the navigatable areas are. Unity also provides finite state machines. Um, and the finite state machines are, are a visible way of kind of moving between states, and you can set up relatively easy drag and drop finite state machines that can link to scripted behaviors, right? So you have states which do particular things, and you move from a patrol state into an active state. Now, if you guys want, we can we can go into some of those, but there are some really good tutorials online. I would use the Unity tutorials on using AI finite state machines because they're up to date with um, Unity 2020, and you want to use the latest um, tutorials, right? So if you're interested in, in Unity finite state machines, they have that built in. And as I said, almost any other AI system you can think of, there will be an asset in the Unity store for you to download and use, right? Including behavior trees and all of those sort of things. Okay, so um, if you want to dig deeper uh, and get further into AI, uh, if you start right, one of the the modern AI tools that's out there, Google um, Google's um, TensorFlow uh, is... Uh, a great AI system, and you can do some really interesting like, visual setup of nodes and create AIs. The AIs done here are hard to control because they are intelligent and they learn, right? So you do have to, yes, be, be a bit careful. If you're, if you're actually trying to support a design experience, going this far and going neural networks isn't a great option. However, if you're trying to understand the player and understand, you know, why the player churned, why they left your game or why they do things, then doing sort of this, this analysis using clustering and using AI techniques to understand the people who play your games, that's a different use of AI. That's a machine learning where we're trying to understand something about the world and I'm going to use AI to help me understand the thing about the world. Okay, so that's a... a the last bit. Okay, so uh, where, where can we take a break? Um, I'm. This is my last slide because I was aiming for that about an hour, uh, and then take a break, and then you guys can do some Q and A with me, right? About AI. Um, so, so as I was saying, the the more advanced AI stuff is using models of behaviors. Um, there is AI being used to try and work out how to extract as much money as possible from people. Um, one of the, the the nastiest versions of this um, is in casinos in the US. So um, you know how you've got those, the, the, the one-armed bandits, right? The, the slot machines that you used to have a lot in Norway, but now you don't have any. Um, but those slot machines uh, in the casinos the parameters by which when they pay out, where they pay out, you know, a small amount occasionally and some and very, very rarely a very large amount of money, right? Now, there's a whole, lot of adjustable parameters around how often you should pay out and, and how big the payouts should be. So what they did is they used genetic algorithms in the large halls filled with those machines. And different machines would evolve different parameters based on how much money they could extract from the people sitting in front of them. And so as so, so technically, that large um, um, room full of those machines is basically an organism, a genetically modifying organism that is evolving to extract as much money from the people who arrive as possible. And it is learning over time, it's adapting, there are different populations near the front where people who have first arrived just go and sit at the nearest machine. They have evolved differently to the ones at the back corner where there's more committed players. And so this is a kind of an adapting organism designed to extract cash, right? So that's kind of a dark pattern for AI in games, but that's the sort of thing that some of these more advanced genetic algorithms, neural network techniques are used for is not 
to be an interesting AI to, for you to play against, but to be an AI to work out how do you get money. There's also AIs to do data visualization and uh, also help you do debugging, right? Where you can create artificial players and you can analyze the player telemetry and do a whole bunch of interesting and complex machine learning based on the data you're getting from the game, right? And so that's something we could dig into more if you feel that that would be an interesting thing to talk about. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take a break now because I've been talking for an hour uh, and I'll let you guys go away, grab yourself a coffee, I might grab myself, it's a Friday night, I'm allowed to, I might grab myself a beer and I'll come back and do some Q&A with you guys. All good? So five minutes, I'll go give the dog a pet because she came back in. Five minutes. We're good. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's a Friday night. <laughs> so it's all Friday afternoon for you guys, but no, I'm in New Zealand. <laughs> so you know, it's okay to have a little bit of refreshment. Um you know, I'm also at my dad's house and so um my dad has his home quite quite a busy house. Um, so I don't know if you can see that clearly, but um, you might be able to see the, the line of books across there that was a railway line for a while. Um, yes, it's my, my father bought a, um, when I was three years old, my, my dad bought a library. And so we had 10, like, you know, somewhere between like 12 and 15,000 books in our house. So. And yes, we had the walls were just lined with books. It was like, yes, an odd way to live. Um, 7 a.m. Friday for you. Ooh, 7 a.m. Friday. That's awfully early. You must be... That's, what, UK? No. Um, well... <laughs> Well, at least it's 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 not sort of four a.m. in the morning. Um, um, but of course, you know, you could be somewhere other than Norway because this is a kind of open channel that we could have other people who just want to come in and see me doing some teaching. Um, so, um, yeah, we're just just going over the the, the lecture. Um, 
but no, honestly, there's some there there's also some you know really good if you look at, at the Unity AI um, tutorials. One of the interesting things for you guys to do is is kind of you know ask me questions about the stuff. But um, if you go into the learn learn Unity, right? So they give you a bunch of of kind of tutorials where to start. Um, and you can go and pay for courses as well, but these are are a really good start, right? So, um, so yeah. So if you're interested, there's lots of good. Um, yeah, and you can sign in and, and go through these courses. Okay. So so yeah. So no, um, I won't sign in at the moment. But but rather than trying to keep up and building and keeping building new um, tutorials uh, my, my purpose here is not to teach you a whole course on AI because you can do that you've got an AI course I uh, was just going to give you an overview of some of the differences between game AI and, and other AI and if you want to dig more then you, there are some really good tutorials come and ask me we can we can go back and forth over the current ones because you know I knew a bunch of really good tutorials but they're now over a year old and I don't know if they're the best anymore so you could go and find new ones that uses the new engine tools and so almost impossible to teach up. Oh Eastern USA okay yeah no okay um are you taking the course remotely or are you just watching me because I'm a random twitch channel But um, oh, I should mute myself rather than just wandering around. Yeah, nothing's happening here. Um, oh, what beer is it? Okay, I'll show you. Um, it's the beer my dad drinks. So it's it's a uh, um. <laughs> that's that's all good. I'm 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 happy that I have some odd people who from all their work. Yeah. Um. So, uh, just for my random stranger who's joined the class. Um. Yeah. No. I I I lecture. Um. Game development, and I happen to be lecturing in Norway from New Zealand. So this is quite an international class. Um. So yeah. It's. Um. Uh, this is a third year game programming class. So we're we're talking this week about AI. So. Um. My third years. Do you have any questions for me about about AI? Uh, now we did we did have some of those meetings where we discussed um, the kind of engines people are using. So there are some of you using Unity. Uh, we've got um, Godot as a game engine. We has SFML as as an engine also being used, uh, and some using um, Unreal. Uh, if you want to have a look at the Unreal stuff. Um, then on the Twitch channel, the as I said, the Monday of this week and the Thursday, Monday I gave this lecture but with more of a, um, a uh, an Unreal bent in the middle, uh, and on Thursday I was playing with the Unreal tutorial on behavior trees. So if you want to learn about behavior trees, Unreal does a relatively good job of that, and so you can go and have a look at that. Um, in terms of thinking about the AI in your game, um, it is best to work out what you're trying to achieve as a designer, right? what the design of the game is and how the AI supports that, rather than just say, hey, let's make a clever AI. Right? Um, because, you know, if you're a top-down shooter, a uh, top-down scrolling game, right, the very best AI is to shoot all their bullets simultaneously as a big curtain of death. Right? And that curtain of death will just go down the screen and kill the player. That's the most effective way of killing the player for the AI. Um, however, it doesn't make a good game. That's why on all of those top scrolling, down scrolling games where you've got these ships flying in, they always fly at the player rather than just create a wall of bullets because you create a wall of bullets, the AI always wins and the player gets, doesn't get to do anything. All right, so it's about finding that balance. Okay, so um, I think I talked to most of the groups during this week. Um, 
So I've talked to seven of the groups. So there's a couple of people who haven't formed groups. Um, what I was going to do, um, given I, uh, this is kind of the last last day for you guys to actually form groups. Uh, if you're not in group yet, I'm going to just allocate you guys to groups, right? So the people who aren't in groups yet, you're going to be put into groups and you're going to have to find a way of collaborating. All right? Now, if you don't want to be put in a group, you need to tell me and um, we can try and work out how to get you the same learning outcomes. All right? But I, I spent some time this week talking to each of the groups uh, about what they're trying to achieve and how I can give the appropriate feedback. Uh, as I said in the... Um, GitLab, in the GitLab repo, we have the the topics to vote on. Um, so if you could go in and vote on the lecture topics. Uh, AI got voted highly, which is why this week was AI. Um, and I think if I go to the general, uh, I think I can get there without sharing additional information. So if I go to the course, so if we have a look at these issues, um, Game AI had 10, so that was the top one. Multi-threaded programming is on 6. Okay, so, um, and we've got some shader stuff down there, um, optimization on 4, but multi-threaded programming. I can I can do, I, I could do the next lecture on multi-threaded programming, if, if you guys want to, if, if that's the, the topic that's next on the list. Um, I'll also go to the boards and I'll move that, um, in my boards across. Come on, can we bring me uh, not game progress? I want to go to the development board, and I can have now done game AI, and we can bring in multi-threading as a to do. What tool would you use for SFML? Um, ooh. See, SFML because it's it's in C plus plus. You could you you could do the Lua plugin, do your AI the scripting language like Lua, but um, SFML AI. I I I haven't actually played with the AI in SFML, so. Um, and it's a it's a game engine, so we can have a look, see what the the internet is suggesting. This is the SCFML forums. Um, I'll make it larger so we can see what they're saying. Um, uh, program by okay, so they're they're just saying you know work it out. You're a programmer, <laughs> so they're rather than saying use this tool, they just say you know go and have a look at the book read the book of programming AI. Um, so what you could look at saying is is that, um, now if you guys are using the uh, FM, um, SFML C++ binding, um, you could then look at um, any of the standard finite state machines in, in um, C++, or you could bind, you could do the Lua binding and then use Lua as your AI, um, Kind of programming language, so yeah. Um, I I know there are there are some examples uh, of using SFML uh, and let's say AI finite state machines. Um, so if you just wanted to use a finite state machine, um, there's a YouTube tutorial. Oof. Such an annoying voice, um, but uh, it's yeah. So it will go through and, and show how to kind of set up a standard state, right? So you set up states or have an interface and implementation. So you set up states and you state, create a state machine that's going to step through those states, and you know you're just programming in C plus plus, so it's a standard AI implementation. Right? So rather than using a tool or a library, you are coding up the AI. Um, system yourself. Oh, okay. You don't have access to that. Um, okay. I, uh, so, so did you request access? So for, for reading the wiki page, once you've popped into the area, you can request access and then I can grant you access. Right? So, um, but I think you have to click on the request access to edit. Okay. I'll, I'll go and fix that um, after we've 
dumb things. It says, um, yeah, we'll get rather than go to the members page while everyone's watching. I'll I'll fix the membership permissions once 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 I stop streaming. So yep, I'll fix that for you. Okay, do we so so do we have any other questions? Do we ask about that? Um, did you kind of understand some of the kind of overview of why game AI is different? I get get that idea. So. So when I'm I'm designing AIs, um, and you know I I I, I could teach a whole course on AI because that's my PhD. My PhD is on, on the functional purpose of REM sleep. So I did neural networks, so deep learning. We did models of associated memory and looked at how you can increase the capacity of a neural network by having an offline phase that's that looks very much like dreaming, right? So you do this kind of offline processing and you move memory from the equivalent of the, of the hippocampus into the neocortex by playing memories that exist in the neocortex while you're transferring knowledge from the hippocampus into that longer term storage. So, you know, if you want me to dig into AI, I've got a whole course worth of AI stuff to do. Um, I also have a whole course worth of multi-threading stuff I could teach. So it kind of, you guys have to decide what you want to extract from me and what you would benefit all right, so that's the. This is part of the challenge I'm giving you is to actually work out what you want me to talk to you about. Uh, now, hopefully, you are working on your games and you're designing them. And I, I, I was asking you how you want to be assessed. So I've asked most of you how you want to be assessed. It does appear that process is going to be part of it. A lot of you want to get better at programming, so we'll be doing code reviews and helping you out in that way. Um, it appears the technology is often more important to most of you than the actual gameplay. So you are doing this to learn to be better programmers and learn to, to make games. You don't that specifically concerned whether this game is the best game in the world or yeah, uh, or you know, even if it's fun, what you're trying to do is you're trying to learn the tool as well as you can. So in the assessment criteria, we'll add some components around technology, we'll add some components around process, we'll add some components about breadth and use of and, and, and of the technology, some reflection on what you learnt while developing, uh, and a section on the game and what and the sort of complexity and interesting aspects of the game as you describe them from what you learnt. Okay, so think of those five, and then we can adjust the weighting for those for each of you independently. Uh, as a uh, each group independently can adjust the weighting, and if you need to within you your own group, you can adjust it for individuals as well. Okay, so we'll try and try and do it that way. Right, so you probably found Lua and SFML, yes, because um, you'll yeah Lua and SFML will will work together quite nicely, and there is there's also some nice instructions on uh, doing. Game AI and Lua. So, um, so um, yeah. So uh, there are books, but there are also online online sessions. So it's it, it, yeah. Some of which you can pay for. Um, so. For the site of the AI agent, would you recommend using a um, bunch of rays to detect the player, or do you have any other ways that um, of having the agent know uh, when they cite the player? Um, so, it depends on the game you're in. Um, one of the, the ways that, that you can optimize some of this is that if you want to, yeah, you're right, firing a bunch of razors is reasonable. Um, however, you might do, you can, can kind of do this in both directions, right? You can fire rays from the player to the, the enemy or from the enemy at the player, right? So it kind of, yeah, you're trying to do those. Um, one of the other things is, is to some extent, it's, it's not necessarily about whether the, the, the AI can actually see the player. It's 
whether the whether that's the appropriate thing for the AI to do at that time. Right? So let's assume that you've got a player who's crouched and trying to take cover. Now, if the AI if the AI could actually see that the butt of the player is sticking out from the side of the of the um, barrier, then the AI can still see the player. But the player's done everything they can to be concealed. So rather than using a ray trace from the the AI to the player to say, well, look, I can um, when I did a, a, a render, when I, when I did a render pass to see if I could see the player, then I could. Um, that may not be the best game mechanic idea. So it may be that when the player is in that location and crouching, we'll just assume, we'll just make it so that the AI can't see them. Right? So the players will succeed at doing what the player intends to do because that's the right thing from a gameplay perspective. Even if, like mechanically, it it isn't um, from the from the it isn't actually what's happening. Okay? Um, another thing you can look at is so how visibility is done uh, often in games when you've got um, if 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 you want to do it really efficiently and you actually want to tech visibility is instead of doing a full colored render pass you write a shader that colorizes the um the player in a like a bright pink and everything else just in, in black and then you get the the graphics cards do a single scene render from the camera perspective of the ai it renders the world with the a with the player in pink and then everything else in black and then you just look for where it, and then you just see where the pink is and then if you can see the pink then yes the ai can see the player all right so you you don't use the game engine's ray tracing feature to see if it can do it you what you do is you use the graphics card ability to render the scene and use that to detect visibility okay but that 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 means so that's if you really care about it being truly pixel perfect correct and you want to spend the time to write a shader that does that right so um if you look up uh using shader to do visibility check um So yes, process only visible in polygon in this fragment shader. Um, so calculating primitive visibility using depth testing. So yeah, so there are there are a few um, ways of examples of, of uh, in a shader. How do you um, how do you know if a three D projection point is visible? And uh, so they give you examples of how to do that visibility check using the using shaders and the graph count. So yeah, so basically what you're doing is you're, you're using a second render pass uh, and what you do is you create that second render pass with its own shader and so you can create a camera with its own shader, right? Because you can attach shaders to cameras. Um, and that camera is in the AI player's head and but it's, it's a simplified shader so it doesn't have to go through and, and do all of the work of using all of the textures and loading all the textures and doing all the, the full render pass. It does a very simplified render pass and so it can generate a, a basically... You are doing a ray tracing, but you're not using the CPU and the game engine to fire a ray. You are basically ray tracing the entire visibility area for a camera placed where the the um, NPC is. All right, so um, that's yeah, that that is one way of doing pixel perfect. But usually, just firing rays knowing if the player doesn't want to be seen and they've done the things that they should do better to give them the benefit of the doubt and say oh the ai couldn't see you even if technically the ai could just because if if, if a player is if as a player you've done everything you can to defeat the ai 
and the AI is still able to see you, then that's just really annoying from the player's point of view. All right, so even if the AI could see the player, you don't let them. Yeah, exactly. All right, so you combination of rays, you see, yep, I, I can see you. If you're not doing the thing that makes you not seen, then I'll start shooting at you. If you're doing the thing that makes you not seen, then I'll pretend I didn't see you. Okay, so yeah, that, that's the sort of combination you can do. Uh, and then you know, that makes the player feel good because they did the clever thing to make themselves less visible, even if it didn't quite work. And if, 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 if you want to frustrate the player a little bit, because sometimes a little bit of frustration is useful, is you randomly let the AI ignore the prone state. Right, so the prone state mostly works. It depends on what you communicated with the player. If you communicated that being in prone you won't be seen, then don't do that. But if you say if the kind of if the player thinks being prone is sometimes visible, then occasionally you let the AI see them, even though if they're doing the being prone or hiding thing. Right, so you know it's about getting that feel right, irrespective of the actual mecha like the mechanics. Any other AI questions, or should I let you guys just get on with making your games this afternoon? Seeing you, I've had, had a meeting with most of you already this week, and, and I've given you a, a lecture. Actually, quite interesting, that, like using those the, the, the multi-passes over the depth. Um, so let's see if I can get some images. Um, okay, yeah, so... Um, like outline shaders yeah actually some of the and you know there's some really neat things you can do with shaders when you're doing some of the tune shading um where it does kind of the the outline shading so you can get the this sort of visible kind of edge of of ray tracing looking quite cartoony which is quite where you it, yeah you manipulate the the mesh and do a, a multiple ray tracing to get kind of the darker outline so there's some neat things you can do in shaders to to create some interesting visual effects, but you can also using um, yeah using shader to um, have to check see if that's gonna right so it's yes yeah, so it's using so they're they're talking about using actually doing a depth check transparency. So you do a second pass where you you ignore the depth and you still show the items behind and stuff, right? So there's there's a bunch of kind of interesting things that that, that people do in shaders to do various different kind of visibility checks. Uh, and here you can see running a first pass where you have the brick wall and the person, and the second pass you render the the legs in front of the brick wall. Right? So you can so having multiple passes to generate some of those interesting visual effects um, can be quite quite useful. Right? So um, so that's using the stencil shader, um, and you know that's a, a that this is an example of of uh, just selecting some part of the rendered world. So you can see that there are some interesting ways of doing these sort of things, and you can use stencil shaders to to create interesting effects uh, and do some visibility checks and things like that um, okay right so the remaining groups um, in fact I should meet with you this this I can meet with you this weekend or on Monday right so I, the remaining groups um, I'll put out another uh, I'll put out another doodle poll so you can find that uh, and I will work through tomorrow because it's, it's getting Already eleven thirty now on a Friday night. Um, I'll I'll work through the people who are in the groups and we'll form those groups and then we'll set up some meetings during the weekend slash Monday morning. Monday morning's probably okay for you guys. Um, if if you aren't in a group or if your group has started, um, start working through those game design stuff and that we can talk about how you'd like to be assessed uh, and also your background so that I know what I'm that I'm trying to what I'm trying to teach is going to help you. Learn what you want to learn during this course. Okay? Right, well, I'll stop recording. Um, and...